Hi, welcome in everybody. We got a great interview today. This is going to be amazing. I mean, uh, this man is, uh, he's like the godfather, godfather of cover crops to me. <laughs> I mean, he's, <laughs> he's been doing this for a long, long, long time. Um, it's Steve Croft. He also has his farm, Cedar Meadow Farm. And uh, we're going to do a little bio. So right now we're just going to go to his page before we get started. My farm look like a hob, like a serious hobby. <laughs> he does because he has so much. It just makes my farm look so like my farm's this big. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so this is Steve. You go to stevegroff.com. Agriculture through leadership. And he's a big leader. He's been on ABC, NBC, Yahoo, TEDx, American Agriculturists, and a whole bunch of others, Sirius XM, CBS, Fox News. He's first and foremost a farmer, but he goes much deeper as an author, thought, uh, through a leader and media influence, influencer. He's a trusted voice for regenerative agriculture and plant-based well, wellness. His dedication to soil health and passion for human health inspires him to bridge the gap between agriculture and consumers who care about the quality of their produce and products. I mean, this man has... He, he, like I said, he's the godfather, guys. He's the godfather. And uh, we're going to learn so much about him. So when guys, when people are starting scrolling, there's 18 people that just came on in. Thank you, guys, everyone, for coming. I'm going to show you a quick video of a movie he started uh, 10 years ago. And hopefully uh, you never know what's going to happen in their future. Hopefully you guys movie. are going to get a lot of out of this, too. Um, there's just going to be stuff that you didn't know. And... It's going to be a really fun interview. So, you know, our know. channels, our channel's been all about all about the soil, and this is this is perfect for yeah. how, what the channel's about. So, this is this going to be a more perfect fit. So, we're going to show you a quick uh, movie when people are uh, rolling on in. It's called the Expedition che uh, Chesapeake Steve Roth Farm dot move. That's what it says down here. So. Let's take a look at the video. I have guarded the entrance to the Chesapeake Bay for more than 200 years. When waterways were highways, I made it safe for vessels carrying all kinds of things, ingots and immigrants, mine and pirate treasure. I watched millions arrive, drawn to the shore. That tide continues to rise and will not be turned back. Tradition and heritage struggle to survive. What will I see in the next 200 years? How will this national treasure be saved? Hey, Dad, I'm going to go check the irrigation again. One person at a time. So I've always uh, wanted to be a farmer. Uh, there, I had never once in my life considered doing anything else. Well, there's a motto that I live by and helps guide me, and it's to leave the soil in better condition than when I found it. What I do in my farm affects other people downstream. I remember after some heavy rains, that we would have to get our tractor and loader out and close the ditches that were washed out in our fields so we could harvest our crops. Sediment going off down the streams into the Chesapeake Bay, that's been a problem. The average soil loss in Lancaster County 20 years ago was 14 tons of soil per acre per year. And at that point, I simply felt that's just not right. So then when I heard about the concept of no-till, which is short for no-tillage, not tilling the soil, not plowing, and how that can reduce erosion, I immediately thought, I'll try that. So a cover crop is, is a plant that is established in your fields that's not designed to be a cash crop. A cover crop, the, the name implies to cover the soil, protect the soil so it's not bare, uh, so the soil doesn't erode, 
seal up the leaks, so to speak, and keep more of it here in our farm. So it's a win-win for farmers and for others downstream. Oh man. Guys ready to eat? Let's pray. How would I feel if someone else's management practices would in impact my farm and I would lose production and lose profitability and so forth? 20 by the 10, 10 got 20. I got 10, 20, 20, 20, I got 10, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. I'm committed to doing the best I can in managing my resources that are under my control. It's an important role that I play. I understand that and I will do my best. My farm is better off now. Anybody can do this. It just takes knowledge and commitment. That was awesome. That was awesome. By the way, if I would have thrown that pumpkin, it wouldn't have made it. Wow, we got a lot to learn here. We guess we got to learn about where he, how, how did he get brought up? Because every, you know, agriculture's changed since, you know, 10, right. 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. You know, what did his parents, how did they farm? It's been a family-owned farm, I believe. So there's a lot of questions to ask. So let's welcome, let's welcome Farmer Steve. Hey. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hey. Good to be here this evening. Thanks for having me on, Joe and Corky. Appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you for coming on and hanging out with us tonight. It's going to be a great night. So tell us about your family farm. When, like, what? How long your family farm has been there? Like. Did you guys, where did your family come from? So, uh, well, where do they come from? That could go way back. Uh, but uh, yeah. 1935 is when my grandparents bought the farm that I'm sitting in the farmhouse right now. So I'm the third generation. And, uh, but just to give you a, fill you a little, little bit there, my father and my mom bought the neighboring farm. So that's where I grew up. It was connected. And it's all uh, since the 60s been farmed together as one. Now, what is really cool is I'm the third generation. Uh, my son, who you saw in that video there, that video was taken a while back. He's now married and has uh, a couple children of his own. Uh, <laughs> they live right next door and he's full time in the farm. So I can tell you the, the, the fifth generation has arrived. Uh, <laughs> As uh, you may have heard the name Joel Salatin, I, I've appreciated Joel over the years. And he made a comment to me one time we were speaking at an event. And and I asked him, you know, how do you you know get your children to uh, want to continue to farm? And he said, you need to romance them. You need to romance your children <laughs> to farm. And I, I took that to heart. And, uh, yeah, we have the fifth generation here now ready to go. Uh, they're, they're, they were just actually here in our house and just left the – couple minutes ago we go back home but uh so that is my brief history uh i certainly uh, have a lot to, to talk about and uh we didn't talk about this before joe but i wrote a book the future proof farm and uh maybe we can talk about that later but uh that that tells that's more in the future so there's the scope you know it's where i come from and where i'm headed so uh, you know, i'm gonna, I'm gonna show that right now when you talk so go ahead I'm going to show you guys his book. You go buy it at Amazon. It's right here, The Future Proof Farm, Changing Mindsets in a Changing World. Yeah. I'll just mention, too, you can go to my website, stevegroff.com, if you want to go there uh, as well. But, uh, but yeah, so that's, again, a little bit of my history and uh, something that, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about. And I, I uh, you had alluded to my parents. Uh, I've, I've really appreciated my, uh, my parents. Uh, they're both gone now, but to to allow me the opportunity to farm, and and you know you probably if, if any of you've been around farmers, you hear stories sometimes where, for whatever reason, some some parents don't even encourage their farm children to to stay in the farm. It's just too hard, or 
it's just whatever. So I'm, I'm glad for this opportunity and, uh, I'm, uh, Certainly uh, appreciate uh, the, found, the good foundation I have to jump off of. Now, since I, I have the book up right here, yeah. how long did it take you to write that? Two years. Wow. Two years. Um, and uh, I'm not really ready yet to write another one. Uh, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. Uh, but uh, I do have a couple more books in my head. But i got a few other things I need to do first here uh, before I write another book. So if you go to Steve's site, that's where you should buy the book. Don't go to Amazon first. Go right here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go to the page because it helps. Go to the page. Yeah. So Cedar Meadow Farm online store. You could order right here. Uh, but that, it, yeah, you're right. It does switch over to the other store. That's right. Okay. Yep. So I'm going to stop sharing that. There we are. So you have developed the ro roller crimper. Tell everybody what the roller crimper is. Yeah. So uh, when I first started uh, the concept of no-till or short for no-till age back in 1982, that's uh, 42 years ago, uh, I did that because we had soil erosion in our sloping fields here that I couldn't cross with my tractors some years. So I had to close it, and I didn't think that was right. Um, so we had to close the ditches. Then I started using cover crops and I really wanted to maximize the use of the cover crops. And if you're doing no-till, when you plant into them, you have to somehow get the, get it smashed down, rolled down or whatever. So I had heard about the concept of rolling cover crops from South America, Brazil and Paraguay is uh, where it really started. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to meet one of the founders of that, at a conference here in the United States in 1995. And I went, proceeded then to get a design and uh, made the first commercial uh, rolling, uh, a cover crop roller in the United States mm. in 1996. And uh, there had been a farmer that I know, that I knew about in North Carolina that was just using a, a regular cultipacker just to roll it down. But as far as I know, I'm the first one to make one specifically for cover crops. And yes. now those roller crippers are used everywhere. Again, I wasn't the, it wasn't my first idea in the world. That happened in, in South America. But here in North America, it was. Now they're fairly, they became very popular, even to the point for gardeners are using the concept. Sometimes it's really small rollers or you're just taking a angle iron or a two by four and put ropes in the end and just say like walking along and, and uh, smashing your cover crop down on your ground. Sometimes you'll put something, a bar or something underneath to get a little crimping action. So you can be that simple if you want. So you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter you know, how small you are, you can still crimp your cover crops. So, uh, but that's, that's, that's a little bit of my story there in the roller crimper. Now with the, you had a seed store. And you were the first person to sell cover crop seeds. Yeah. Can you tell everybody a little bit about that? And the radish. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things I I eventually did that I never set out to do. Uh, <laughs> there's also things I set out to do and never amounted to anything. So any entrepreneur understands that statement. But uh, back in, uh, let's see, uh, back in... Um, 1996 it was, I was speaking at a conference in uh, Maryland and I made a comment, do cover crops pay? And this is speaking to farmers. And I said, and I questioned myself, I said, I'm wondering if you do no-till long enough, do we need to bother with cover crops? And it was an honest question. And other people were asking it too. Well, uh, Dr. Ray Weil, a very well renowned soil scientist from the University of Maryland, was also speaking at the meeting. He came up to me afterwards and said, Hey, would you want to do some research on uh, on cover crops, some long term research? He said, I got some grant funding. I said, Well, I'd be honored. So, what that led to was a 12 year project. And the first three years, we were doing uh, yields on the crops following that, because that's as a farmer, you know, it's, it, you have to you know, make, pay the bills and uh, make everything work. And the first three years, we didn't see a lot of difference. The fourth year, we had a drought. And we're uh, in our test plots, where we had the cover crops planted the previous three years, 
we yielded 25% higher in yields. So basically what we had been doing is we were building up our soils over that time and really didn't understand much how that all works at the time. But when we had a dry year, a, a year with uh, you know some challenges, that's when our investment of cover crops and soil health paid off. Okay. So after 1999, that was that drought year, I've never asked that question since, do cover crops pay? I then switched to how can we maximize their potential use? How can we make them more effective? And again, in 2020, uh, 20, 2001, uh, Dr. Ray Wallace had got another grand idea. Let's test some of these brassica type cover crops. He'd seen some down in uh, Brazil again, uh, where they were using them to help defend against soybean root knot nematodes, which can be in soybean fields. It can build up over time. And they had found that these radishes, somehow the soybeans grew better the following year after you planted these radishes. And they attributed it to an effect they were having on the nematodes and thought. And I remember him saying, you know, would you want to be a part of this? I said, well, I don't really have that problem on my farms. He said, well, that doesn't matter. We need a couple farms to do this. Well, as it turned out, he brought he couldn't get the radish variety that he uh, saw in uh, Brazil. So we tried a couple of different type of brassica crops. And, and again, mine was one of five farms plus the research station where they did these tests. And I didn't think much of it until the following spring, we went to plant into the plots. I was going to plant corn. And I noticed how nice and mellow the soil was. And it was just... No, it was just beautiful. And, and you had these little holes where the radishes had grown, winter killed, decayed. And we tested the yields because this was research. And we got like a uh, 10% yield increase. It's like, wow, that's very significant. And I remember saying, have you seen this on your other farms? And he said, yeah, matter of fact, every single farm showed a yield increase. We're like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, the grad student that was doing the research on nematodes uh, uh, got inconsistent results around the farms for the nematode population, but consistent results for yield increases. So we kind of pivoted to figure out, you know, obviously we get paid on yield, so this is a good thing. And uh, <clears throat> so that led to me starting to grow these radish seeds. We, we identified uh, one. And in 2004, I started Steve Groff Seeds, which was, the, to my knowledge, the first company I'm going to say that I know of uh, that literally was formed to sell cover crop seeds. Now, there's a lot of other seed companies that sell forages and, uh, you know, commodity crops and stuff that then started selling cover crops later. But mine was formed to sell cover crops. So hence uh, the world's first cover crop seed company. So I, I that, that went for 12 years, that company. And then I get out of it, and moved on to other things. But uh but that was, uh, yeah, the, the, the tillage radish came out of that. That's worldwide now. There's actually the largest seed company in the world, DLF, sells tillage radishes today. Oh, nice. Yeah. I wanted to do the cover crops with turnips one year. My oh, husband, yeah. my husband wouldn't let me. Oh. But <laughs> I wanted to do that one year. Now, if I did that, like, say, for instance, in my raised beds, mm -hmm. like, what would be the benefit for my raised bed? Well, um, if you're able to get them planted, uh, I know you're from uh, Northeast Ohio, get them planted by the middle of September. So anything that's finished with your, you know, your garden, uh, try to get about six or eight seeds per square foot or more. You, you'll think it's not enough, but trust me, they'll grow and they'll fill in um, and they'll grow up until we have uh, about Thanksgiving or Christmas somewhere in there. And then they'll usually winter kill unless the temperatures don't get below 10 degrees, they might not winter kill. But what they do, uh, Corky, is the, the one of the things that made the rat, what we found out later once we understood uh, how they work, is they have a very aggressive tap root that goes deep into your soil. Everybody sees these white tubers. It's a daikon type radish. Everyone sees it and they think, oh, that's cool. And that, that's what does the work. And Well, yeah, but it's actually the aggressive tap root that can go four or five, we've measured seven feet deep in soil. Wow. Uh, really up nutrients that your 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 garden vegetables probably don't get. And usually there's 
micronutrients down that deep that we're never tapped into. So, you know, that's the tuber then is your nutrient silo. Uh, okay. and, and basically it's, it's depositing them in the soil surface. So that's where we can get the benefits of them, where they actually root down in, bring up nutrients to the top and deposit them there. And they're very readily available because radishes will decompose very quickly. Okay. Uh, what happened to winter kill? You can easily chop them off with a shovel or something in the spring, and and they'll be done. Now, say for instance, I don't know. This is this is whatever, but I I want to get pigs eventually. So uh -huh. could I pull those up and give them to my pigs? You sure could. Uh, if you want to uh, use a dual purpose, um, you're going to lose some of the benefits of that nutrition that's going to go to your pigs now instead of your garden. But your choice. Uh, this is a farmer's dilemma all the time. Also, so it's basically, that's basically your call on that. So you're going to sacrifice a little, but then again, you're giving your pigs some good feed. So, yeah, that's really, really interesting. And I didn't think about the fact that it's pooling things that yeah. like other vegetables wouldn't get. It's just pulling that yeah. from below. And um, right. mm -hmm. it kind of has the same concept as sunflower. Basically, no. Sunflower has a nice tap root. Uh, it's not as aggressive as radish, but yeah, you, your point is well taken. Uh, yeah. Sunflowers also are good if you can put them in your garden uh, whenever you can. It's always nice to have a few of them anyway. Uh, but sunflowers uh, are, are, are good. I actually plant sunflowers in my fields as a cover crop. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I'm almost thinking like asparagus, how it just goes whoop, all the way down, reaches all those. The, you know, the soil all the way down below, like you're discussing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That just got my, my whole. I know. Mind it gets your mind moving. Like, what am wow. I doing? You know, it's a wild. It gets your mind moving. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I want to keep on asking questions to it, but it's not, <laughs> it's like, wow. And David um, Gray says burdock. Well, yeah, you don't want to plant burdock because that will spread. But like, yeah. things. I understand burdock does have some health quanti health qualities about it if you know what you're doing in that regard, but be careful with that because that's a na that can become a nasty weed really quick. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's very persistent. Uh, I understand the use for it, but um, don't plant your whole bed of burdock. <laughs> <laughs> you're selling it for some home remedy or something, and you know that's your gig. But yeah. Now, Steve, you're also the first uh, no-till uh, tr for transplant tomatoes, yeah. right? You to, yeah. So you, and how yeah. did you? Do so here again, another cool story. Um, I'm at 1994. Okay, I'm at a meeting at Penn State University, and there's this guy from the USDA Beltsville Agriculture Research Center, which is right, right outside of DC, and he's showing these pictures of him no-till transplanting tomatoes into rolled down um, uh, hairy vetch and rye and crimson clover. And I'm like, wow, because you got to understand, I started no-till in 1982 and that was with corn and soybeans and wheat and alfalfa. Now I grew pumpkins, I grew tomatoes, transplanted tomatoes. And I remember my cousin telling me, he was a farmer at the time, in like the late 80s, he says, well, Steve, when are you going to sell the plow? I'm like, can't sell the plow. I got a plow to grow my tomatoes and plow to grow my squash. <laughs> well, I see this guy giving his report. Well, guess what? In about July, uh, Washington, D.C. is only two hours from me. I head down there to see him. I want to see for myself. And uh, sure enough, I like what I saw. So, uh, so then what I did then is, I, I used a concept planter that they had developed, but then I made my own uh, to be more commercially uh, viable for, for what I was doing at the time. So that's the brief story of how that got started. And all it took was one year of testing and never looked back. Been no till ever since. Nice. Now, dumb it, like, I don't know. I guess you'd have to dumb it down for me a little no. bit on the no-till method. So say for instance, I did, I planted hairy vetch in yeah. all of my beds. And then the next year I'm going to plant. Mm -hmm. Now I'm still going to have obviously vines or whatever left mm -hmm. over. I plant right on top of those. So it's recommended it that you plant hairy vetch. Okay. There are many different ways to do it right. 
it, it, you're going to have to find your own story. I like to tell people so you can plant your hairy batch and it, it'll grow up out a foot. Then it falls down and it vines all around like peas would if you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't do anything to peas. Uh, so that's not that hard. Then when it starts to bloom is when it's reached its full production of nitrogen is what you really like out of hairy batch. It's, it really can give like if you're going to plant sweet corn or something like that, it'll really make your corn grow well. So, um, and again, I would say if you're going to plant sweet corn at that spot, just straight hairy vetch is not a bad idea. But if you're trying to plant tomatoes, peppers, or things like that, mixing it with a cereal rye or a wheat or, or something like that gives a, the, the, the green has a uh, stiff uh, stalk and it gives a trellis for the hairy vetch to grow. It's like synergy there because the hairy vetch will grow better because it's off the ground. and the hairy vetch is providing a little nitrogen for your grain. So there's it's like one plus one equals three. There's two. And then what are you going to do when it's three, four feet tall? Well, you're going to have to push it down. That was why I got a roller. Uh, so you're going to have to somehow get it down, get something that, that you can crimp it with, and just start Googling a little bit, and you can find some people now who are doing this at garden scale. Um, and by the way, just – just to make sure you guys understand, I am a commercial farmer. If I, I farm 200 acres, but I have my own garden, uh, raised beds, and we have a winter garden that we use all winter long because I want to grow as much food as possible for our own consumption. Uh, but just as that's an FYI, but back to the management of cover crops, uh, when you have something like hairy vetch or small grains uh, that, that come through the winter, you're going to have to push them down. You can cut them off if you will uh, you know that depends how much time how big of an area there's lots of different ways i'm going to drop uh, two names right now if you're taking notes get your notepads out uh, <clears throat> jesse frost is one of them he's from i think kentucky he is a, a no-till gardener uh i mean he's got a lot of this figured out you get on his website he has a lots of blogs and podcasts whatever um another one is brian o'hara Brian O'Hara is from uh, Massachusetts, and um, I should have had his book up here. I'm not sure where it's at right now, but he also wrote a book. If you, if you Google his name, Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, O'Hara, O'Hara, Brian O'Hara. He has a small market garden uh, that he actually sells off of it, uh, and that, that book is for people who are really serious because – it, it, it's going to go over some people's heads. Just tell you right now, he gets pretty, pretty deep. I mean, he's making a living off this, uh, not selling the books, but but growing the marketing produce. But he's very articulate and describing what he's been doing for like twenty or thirty years. So those two names are the names I usually uh, share to people that they want to, you know, look at something uh, that they can, you know, read and 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 get get a little more educated on, on the nuances. You see, going from a, we'll just call it a conventional or traditional style of gardening to more of a no-till cover crops, regenerative agriculture, it's not easy. And I'm going to say that up front. I'm not a here to be a cheerleader tonight uh, because I want to give you reality. You will have to do research. You will have to talk to your friends. The best thing I can advise any of you is to find someone who is doing what you want to achieve. And there, I don't know if this group talks to each other or not, but uh, find people who are like-minded, ideally someone who is doing what you would like to achieve is the best. So find a mentor. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube, a lot of stuff online. Absolutely. Uh, and then you try. Try what, see what works for you, what works for your situation. And this is very important. So going from being a, uh, just a you know traditional gardener to, to, to what I'm talking about here is like going from a nurse to a surgeon. Uh, I want to use that analogy because it's not easy. And, and there's things you have to learn. And you have to fit it into your style, your situation. Yeah. I mean, I have had people drive from Manhattan, New York City. A guy called me up. He said, can I come and visit your farm? I'd like to learn about what you do. I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, I'm from Manhattan, and I do container gardening and rooftop gardening. I said, whoa, 
I don't know. I don't know if I want to talk for you. <laughs> he said, that's okay. I want to spend a day with you. So he came down. It was really, it was really fun, actually. But, but you know, there's obviously a, a little, I mean, of course, he, he wanted to use cover crops in his container garden. He said, why do I have them empty all winter? We're not going to grow some. I said, exactly. So here am I, a 200-acre farmer, giving some advice to, uh, uh, yeah, thanks for putting up that, uh, that, that thing for Jesse Frost. That's, that's exactly what I'm talking about right there. Uh, so, and there you go. Um, yep. No-till intensive vegetables. You guys are on it. So these are the type of things you need to do. So I, I want to just give that kind of reality check right up front. This all sounds great and it is great. Uh, but give yourself some time, give yourself some patience. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, well worth it. Uh, once you, once you get the knack of it. So what would you expect you First year growing, you're putting it down. That's all they like to do. Hey, throw some hairy vetch down or whatever. What would you expect from year one to yeah. year five? And um, what would you see? There's a, a little bit of advice I would give. And uh, if you have the opportunity to start with something like spring oats and the and the tillage radish or the daikon radishes, there's different names out there. Because <clears throat> anywhere north of I-70 in the United States, just use that as a guideline um that's probably going to winter kill and that will make it easier for you to manage your garden in the spring if you're not used to cover crops there'll be like dead residue there uh as you start getting a little more braver growing something that survives the winter like a hairy vetch like a cereal rye uh then you will be then that's that's kind of like the next level uh now you can start there uh and some of you have probably passed all this already then you can start getting very complex mixes, 12-way mixes. Uh, you could start filling in areas that, let's just say you have your sugar peas are finished in June. Uh, what are you going to plant then? Well, if your garden's big enough that you don't have to plant something for you to grow, that's a great time to plant sorghum sedan grass, sun hemp, cow peas. They're the great summer crops. They will increase the health of your soil the fastest okay. because they can grow the most. Uh, if you have the luxury of having that space that you don't have to grow food in every single square foot. So you, so here again, everyone's situation is different. Uh, but uh, that's just a little hint. To, if, you, if you have soil that is um, pretty poor quality, I would encourage you to, uh, to, to grow a summer cover crop where you can. And, uh, the other thing, too, if you can bring in uh, leaves, compost, um, don't get too much of anything though. Uh, you can too much of a good thing is too much sometimes. Uh, and you have to, there's, there's a lot of things to understand here. Um, a little cautious sometimes about compost. Most of the compost that you buy at a store is, is good, but don't assume it is. Uh, there's, there can be some bad stuff come along with compost. Sometimes. Just because it's compost doesn't mean it's golden. Uh, and again, who do you trust? Uh, you may have a neighbor that's been in the business for 30 years and like their well reputation. Well, go buy from them uh, if that's what you have. Or do your own compost. These things, you know, so there's so many different ways to do this uh, and you have to kind of find your niche. So, Joe, to answer your question, it really does depend what are you starting with. Some have very productive soils. Some is very poor soils. So where you end up in year five, if you understand where you're, what you're starting with, and and then can do some of these things here to speed it up, uh, that's very going to be very very helpful. Um, or you just may not get much accomplished if you don't put something into it. Some soils are very dead. Uh, my my daughter lives two and a half hours away from us, and they just bought a house a couple years ago now. So uh, we. We got some soil here from my farm, some of the best soil, and made sure there was earthworms in it, by the way, <laughs> down there and, and, and kind of like spread it over their garden. And they brought in a bunch of leaves. And, and it's, I guess they're two, this will be the third year, and it's starting to, starting to come around. Uh, so, that, you know, with some tender, loving care and some, you know, some uh, prudent amendments that you put on there. Uh, you can you can make it good. Now, you know, I'll just say too many leaves sometimes can bring the pH down, the acidity. It depends what leaves they are, especially if you know you want to probably avoid pine needles. 
Uh, wood chips, you got to be careful. Um, not many. Uh, it's good if they're composted first. These are just some little things I'm kind of scattered uh, giving giving you. Some of the, some of you I know this is old hat. Others of you are just starting. I I, I want you to learn from those of us who made those mistakes. <laughs> so. Gail made a post here, and I just wanted to bring this up. On a small-scale gardening, I could do no-till gardening. This year, I haven't tilled anything at this point, but she hasn't put a cover crop down. Mm -hmm. So she she should she should be putting down compost pretty much right now. The leaves on top of the compost. What, what any suggestions for Gail? Yeah, if, if you if for whatever reason you know you you know it's too late for most people to plant cover crops now. You want to start planting your uh, peas and potatoes soon. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you know, we'll be getting yard clippings soon. Again, just don't put them on too thick. Um, but uh, but you can you can sprinkle them on, you know, all year uh, if you if you have yard, you know, uh, grass clippings. Uh, and I remember my grandma, she was way ahead of her time. We all we kind of made fun of her, not in a bad way, but, uh, you know, she would be proud of what I've done. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you that. Um, oh, I want to make a comment about that alfalfa mark comment there. I just saw it pop up, but my grandma would lay newspapers down and that was her weed barrier and, you know, newspapers decay quickly then. And she would cover that newspaper with grass clippings and stuff. And, you know, newspapers, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so, yeah, whatever you have, whatever resource that you have handy uh, or you can get is is is, is excellent. Uh, the person who made a comment about alfalfa hay, it's spot on. There's something almost magical about alfalfa hay. And part of it is, is, is it, you don't have to know too much about chemistry and biology, but, um, but, but basically alfalfa has nitrogen in it. It's high in protein. There's a relationship there. So when alfalfa starts to decay and break down, it's providing nitrogen for your garden vegetables. And there's something about alfalfa and tomatoes in particular, so much so that I am now putting alfalfa hay along my tomato rows in my commercial four acres of tomatoes that I grow. Uh, and it's, it's good alfalfa hay, not rained on, not like mulch type alfalfa. You want high quality alfalfa hay. And some people feel this hasn't been proven scientifically yet, but some people feel that just some of the enzymes and and stuff that's in the alfalfa is something that is is good. Now I see someone asked about alfalfa pellets. I would assume in a for a fertility situation, absolutely alfalfa is a nitrogen source. Um, and there's other things in there that I don't think we fully understand yet. But yeah, alfalfa can't go wrong with alfalfa. I'm glad, oh. I'm glad someone brought that up because I hadn't I hadn't thought about it. And then I can feed that to my chickens as well. If I you want can. To. Or your horse or your goat or your sheep or yeah. whatever you have. Uh, and I know for those of you who live in a suburban area, alfalfa is very expensive. Uh, if you can go out to a farmer somewhere and buy a few bales, it'd be like one third the cost probably. Uh, but there again, what opportunities you have. If you have the opportunity to get some alfalfa to use as a mulch, uh, that is definitely one of the top ones I'd recommend. Now, Steve, I know you don't soil test as much as you used to. Yeah. It's a lot seldom. But Serena has a good question here. Um, I don't know if you can read that. Uh, do farmers with large cornfields, cotton, et cetera, um, uh, do they do soil testing before planting again every three months during the growing season? Okay. So typically your average farmer will soil test at a minimum of every three years, at a maximum every year. Uh, and some farmers now get even, they do grid sampling where they'll test sec sections of the field. So the general feeling in the regenerative agriculture community, those of us who find ourselves there, is we do care about soil testing, the chemical analysis, the nitrogen, the potassium, the phosphorus, the sulfur, the calcium. We care about that. If I would rent a new field, uh, I would, first of all, I would take a soil test to see what am I working with here? Are this, is there something way high out of balance? Is there something way low? 
And then I would address that. I would deal with that. But now uh, I have to explain is we have soil health tests that test the soil health, the microbial populations, the balance between fungi and bacteria and all kinds of critters that I can't even pronounce. <laughs> uh, and th these are, this is becoming the new frontier. I'm actually more concerned about that. Matter of fact, I've even gotten DNA testing done of my soil. And it's fascinating. Um, one of the companies I work with, and this was more for research, they are finding new species of soil microbes that have never been identified before. Uh, and it's not just my farm. I'm just, I'm just using it as a blanket statement. It's really cool. And I, this is where I'm going to say, we know more about the galaxies than the six inches underneath our feet. And that's a fact. Yeah. Uh, and that's sobering uh, to understand that because I'm going to get on my soapbox here a little bit because the last 50, 70, 80 years, we've ignored the biology in our soils as farmers. I'm speaking collectively as farmers and gardeners a little bit, I could say. Not, they're not as guilty. Uh, but so now we're realizing, oh, there's something there. And, and from my perspective, we need to start to now understand more how the so soil was designed to function. How do we work with nature and not, uh, not against it? And, um, you know, you look at a woods, an area that has been untouched by human intervention, and you never see a deficiency in the plants. Mm -mm. And they're never fertilizer, they're fertilized. And, yeah, you might have some insects come through sometimes. You may have some disease, but generally very minimal. How does that work? Uh, now, I'm not suggesting that we go out and forage for berries and nuts, but what can we learn from that where today, as soon as you see an insect, you buy a pesticide and spray it? Yeah. Or as soon as you see a little leaf mold, you buy a fungicide and spray it? Um, I use very little pesticides. I don't use any in my tomatoes. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> uh, so there you go, in case you're wondering. I, I, I do this with nutrition. I'm, I'm getting around to my testing now. And I don't know how many of you have heard of SAP testing. I wish I could ask for a show of hands. But uh, SAP testing is where they literally test the sap that's inside the leaves. And it's not that they grind up the leaves. Some of you are probably familiar with tissue testing and analyze the leaves. Now, this analyzes the plant sap. And you take from the lowest fully functioning, or excuse me, the oldest functioning leaves, in other words, they're still green, and the newest fully formed leaf on the same plant. And you do that in your, in your, in your field, like in tomatoes in my case. And you, you get that analyzed. That can give you an almost up to the day of what that plant is extracting or what that plant is seeing, what that plant is getting out of your soil. So that's where I'm leaning to now because I want the plant to tell me what it needs. Uh, that's more accurate than these tests. These tests are good, but they're not 100%. Uh, so, uh, to answer the question about how often do farmers do this, uh, you can, you can, uh, it's, it's really depends where you're at and where you're at on your, on your history of, of growing things. So traditionally, uh, once every year or three, uh, to take soil tests. And now the latest is more sap testing or soil health testing. That's where I'm at. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to go back to another question. <laughs> tomatoes. Yeah. Right. How many, how many tomatoes, since you live on a farm and yeah. how many tomatoes do you actually grow? And how many do you actually sell? Like what's your whole tomato production? Oh, okay. Um, so I sell, I grow 25 varieties of heirloom tomatoes. 25 varieties, about 10,000 plants. That's four acres, all in high tunnels, all soil grown. Um, and this is where I spent a lot of my time and efforts uh, in that. So, uh, so if you take four acres, that's about 
200,000 pounds, 100 <laughs> tons. Uh, so it's a lot of tomatoes. I have 10 full-time workers, 10 full-time employees. Because we very carefully, we if you know anything about tomatoes, we, we prune them to, to three liters. They're on strings, and then we lower the strings as they grow. Because hmm. so they keep growing. By the end of the year, the stalks are like 10 feet long, but we keep lowering them, so we keep picking them. So that's 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 what we did. It's very intensive, um, but um, that's I've I've kind of got a, a a good market now. Uh, we sell into the distribution goes from New York City to Washington D.C. That whole uh, corridor there into many stores and restaurants. I, I I sell about seven different distributors that distribute into that region. Wow. Now when you ship them. Of course, you know, like other countries, you go into a store, they're green or whatever, you know, until they turn a collar. Not here, but I'm just talking about your regular red. Mm -hmm. When do you actually pick and ship? So heirloom tomatoes, as everybody probably knows, they're popular because they taste good. Mm -hmm. They're also kind of cool. <laughs> the colors, the shapes, the sizes, the flavors. And so I mentioned I plant 25 varieties. That's very intentional. Because when we sell them to the stores and restaurants, we sell them in 10-pound boxes. There's 10 pounds. Right. I like to have a minimum of six different varieties. It's usually 10 or 20 tomatoes, uh, you know, depending on the size and everything. Because it really looks nice. It's colorful. And I, I try to stay away from red tomatoes because that's traditional. Mm -hmm. uh, so most of the very few reds. So that gives you a little picture in your mind. Uh, so we because around here people don't want heirlooms they Pardon? want they want that market mm -hmm. uh perfect red tomato if they see an heirloom if it has a crack in it or something like that they kind of turn their nose up at it a little bit so it makes me wonder like you just must the people must just where you're selling is must love heirloom varieties well, well yeah you have to pick your customers um uh, and it become a lot more popular in the last five years or so. Um, so, so yeah, I, I love growing those heirlooms because it's a challenge. Yeah, um, it's a challenge. Uh, and yeah, we get a price premium, but you know, I could get higher yields with commercial varieties, but that's boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah what so that's What are the top like varieties that you? Um, a uh, Hawaiian haze uh, is one we really like. Uh, Cherokee purple we mentioned. That's my husband's favorite. Uh, there's a new one that I that I like. Uh, it's it's um, Cubre Libre. My Spanish isn't very good. <laughs> uh, that's good enough for it. Say that two times fast, Joe. Uh, no, 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 I give up. <laughs> the yellows, there's nothing beats the lemon boy. Very yellow. Um, and there's uh, black crim. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's black or purple tends to taste best. That's just my favorites mm. uh, for taste and, and sweetness and just the flavor. Um, so, yeah, and there, there's um, I don't grow cherry tomatoes anymore, but there's uh, one called black cherry that uh, wow, that's like eating candy. You can't just eat one. <laughs> no. So. Yeah, I love tomatoes. I mean, I'm like I said, I'm my grandpa grew tomatoes here in this farm in the fifties. So there's been tomatoes grown in this farm for a long, long time. I love them. I probably eat some days. I'll eat three or four tomatoes just right like an apple. I just have you grown any food. heirlooms that your grandfather or anybody has oh, grown? No. See, what's interesting over the years? What's interesting is uh, in the 1950s. A little history lesson here. And this is crazy to think about this now. So we're in southeastern Pennsylvania, right? In the 1950s, they would pick green tomatoes here in August, pick them green, and sort them, put them on a truck, and put ethylene gas on them as they go to New York City so they'd be right by the time they get there. Oh. Can you imagine that now? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> oh, I remember when I was a kid, we did that up till like the 80s, I guess, the early 80s, I think. It's wow. uncool. It I mean, makes you wonder if people back then actually knew what a tomato really tasted oh, like unless they grew it themselves. themselves. But, but see, everything was about shipability. They got to be hard like baseballs. 
you know, we want them to ship. And we want them to not bruise. Uh, boy, times have changed, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, transporting them has changed, too. Oh, well, yeah. You put them in single-layer trays now. Yeah. And you, uh, you ask, I think, what stage we pick them at. We pick them at just, like, two days before they're ripe. Because we okay. pick them, pack them, they go to distribution, they go to the store. <clears throat> they're they're going to be in the store in three days, maybe four. So we, we pick them. They're not quite dead ripe yet, um, if you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah. So that's, that's when we pick them. Interesting. So before you went to cover crops, you do you grow peppers too? I used to. Now, did you see a change before you went to the no-till? Because my my belief is a lot of people have problems growing peppers because their their the roots don't grow. Yeah. So they're only growing on. You know how we have six inches of soil. Yeah. Well, everything's we're down to our last inch of soil, pretty yeah. much. Right. And I believe if you farmed all those years, that will six inches soil, maybe you were growing on two inches of soil. So the peppers never rooted right. So peppers were small. It depends where you're at uh, in soil depth, but peppers are a little harder to grow than tomatoes. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll say with the no till, and this is just, again, I'm going to throw this out there. The one of the the negative things about a cover crop and no-till is the soil remains cooler in the spring and you your, your peas aren't going to be factored in much because they're cold crop but you have something like a warm weather crop like tomatoes and peppers um they won't like that cold soil so i recommend that if you transplant tomatoes early this is where you want to keep about a, a foot diameter around your plant of soil that the sun can hit. And then once they get established, then pull that back over the, the, the straw, the residue, the alfalfa, or whatever you're doing, just to get them started. Especially for warm watermelons, cantaloupes, those type of things. So like in my no-till garden, uh, when I plant those warm season seeds, if I'm planting seeds, I leave it exposed so the sun can warm that up. Now here's the good thing. In the summer, it keeps your soil cooler as well. That's two for two things that keeps your plants healthier because they don't like heat. There's it, it, a bare soil can be 130 degrees on a 90 degree day. Just measure it with a meat thermometer sometime. You probably have one in your kitchen. Uh, and uh, the other thing, too, is neither do microbes like hot soil. It kills them uh, or they don't do anything. Microbes are like us. They flourish at 72 degrees. That's what we like. That's the temperature humans are comfortable at. That's what that's where microbes are the best. Once it gets above 90, microbes start shutting down, just like we as people. Once it gets below 72, 60s, 50s, microbes start shutting down. We would too, but we have clothes to put on. All right. So there's a there's really interesting dynamics here. When you think about covering the soil, it's an armor. To your soil and it keeps it from getting too hot and too cold so not that soil that's covered won't freeze i'm not saying that but i'll tell you what it freezes later and your microbes can be more active longer uh, into the fall and they can do more for you that's why over time this system has its advantages it doesn't just happen the first year you decide to to do this but when you get a couple years into this you do it right, you'll start to see your soil get more like a chocolate cake uh, that's darker in color and there's yeah. nice pores and aggregation and so forth. So so what is your opinion on garden fabric? Well, I, uh, I'm i going to say my opinion. I won't use it. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's my opinion. Um, I've used it for a long time in my high tunnels. It's really nice because it keeps everything clean, keeps the weeds down. But the worms don't like it um, because they can't come up and feed as easy. They can feed a little bit underneath there, but that's not what the way they need air. They need, you know. So I'm not hard on people. You got to, I'm, wherever you're at, just try to go the direction here that I'm, I'm saying. Uh, give yourself some time, learn about it. Uh, but I would try to get away from the garden fabric uh, as soon as conveniently possible. Okay. Yeah. Cause I mean, we have that all over mm -hmm. our garden. Well, keeps the weeds down because 
yeah, we have obnoxious, obnoxious level of weeds. <laughs> like, and in the walkways, I can uh, see that yeah. some people put it over their raised beds, even, and they just have their plants growing out of it. That I just can't quite endorse that. Yeah, um, I don't have that, but right. um, well, it's okay. Uh, you know, I say that's what weed eaters are for. I you know, every two weeks we weed eat between our raised beds and try to, you know, keep the weeds down. But some some weeks you skip a week and then it's like, dang, they're three feet tall them weeds. Yeah. Anyway. Yes. Well, Steve, you get a lot when you're doing the cover crops, you're getting a lot less weeds in the first place. Right? Yeah. And with a caveat, it depends what your weed seed bank is. What's the history of your garden? How good have you been at keeping weeds down? Because if you've been pretty good at it, you're not going to have a lot of weeds there in the first place. But if you just, you know, by July, you give up every year <laughs> and it just takes over with weeds. <laughs> nah, a cover crop is going to help, Joe, but yeah. it's still, there's a limit. There's a limit to everything. It's all about multiple uh, strategies here to make this work. Interesting. So basically a cover crop could also just help with basically choking out any weeds that could be yeah. potentially be there. And now uh, it's not going to choke out perennials. Like if you have a little patch of thistles trying to come up or that burdock you said a little bit earlier, <laughs> it's not going to, it's not going to take that out. Uh, there are some troublesome perennial ones that can get into your garden sometimes. Dandelions, you, you know, you're going to have to get them out by hand uh, probably. So. Okay. And water and you, you have, you could, you will water less if you have cover crops. Yes, because it, it keeps some moisture uh, in the ground, and uh, especially over dry uh, dry times. Now, again, I want to give you both sides of all the coins here. Um, if you have a very wet spring, and, um, you know, even in gardening sometimes, it's just almost too wet to plant. Now, in, in farmers, when you have a heavy tractor, you have to wait till it dries. You don't have to wait as long for a gardener. But sometimes your soil can stay wet longer because you have that cover there. And so this is where the management comes in. You may want to uh, open up where your rows are going to be a week or two ahead. And just so you let some sun in there so it starts drying out. Uh, on the other hand, this is where having a living cover crop uh, uh, th that you, uh, you can help suck the moisture out that way. Um, so anyway. Hmm. So I see someone said about using LP burn on the rows to kill weeds prior to planting. Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about flaming, pro using propane. I guess that's what it is. That's what I, uh, I don't do that. I know some people do it. I don't really have a problem with it. Um, you know, if that's if you have large enough air, I just weed whack it off myself. But uh, but there's people do it. Um, you know, if that's your thing, I don't know. I'm not going to do it. But uh, it's not not that bad i guess yeah i mean i'm i'm fortunate enough that i just have like an electric weed whacker okay i just go in there and weed whack everything it's not very big but um it works out pretty well but uh, but we only do it like twice twice a summer all right it doesn't get that bad but mm -hmm. still you get those like the straw weeds and stuff like that there's mm -hmm. i don't know what weed it was but last year i had this it was like grass really? and it was harder than heck i literally had two hands and i was pulling at it as hard as i could and it would not come out and was i had that everywhere was it very fine stem like a grass you grow in your yard yeah i bet that was rough stem bluegrass look it up rough yeah. stem bluegrass because that's, that's becoming more and more of a problem around here even in our fields and i don't like that weed i mean it gives a good root structure but like you said it's it's uh, kind of a pain. Yeah, I had to literally dig it out. I couldn't. Yeah. Yep. What a pain. <laughs> okay, how about this? Using cover crops. And, well, we got this, well, a bad guy in the garden usually. And, well, I've seen all these pumpkins and stuff. And I've seen the squash and things. But how about our nemesis, the vine borer? Oh. So does this cover crops help a little bit? How does how does that work? I'm gonna have to say I don't know, and I'm saying that I grow a lot of pumpkins. Mm -hmm. I grow 50 acres of pumpkins and 20 acres of squash. So 
I know about vine borers. I generally have about a three to five percent of vine borer uh, that that get in my crop. Now that's okay for a large scale like I'm doing. Yeah. I am not going to try to treat them. It's not worth it, uh, and they're very difficult to control. You know, with insecticide, I don't use insecticides anyway. But I'm just saying there's there's no really good remedies other than other than I grow pollinator strips. Uh, we call them where we grow. Uh, flowers that attract uh, beneficial insects, or you could call it a biological zoo. Maybe that would be a better word. There, are, if you get into this study in it, there are certain um, flowering plants that attract pests, or I should say, uh, beneficial insects that eat the pests, like aphids, thrips, uh, maybe even vine borers. But I haven't made the connection yet. What do I do? What is the pest? that feeds on the vine borer. Every single um, plant, every single plant um, has a, um, all right, so every single insect has an enemy. And usually nature has a way of working that out. That's why I gave the example in the woods. It's usually pretty pristine. What we have done out in our fields, uh, and sometimes gardeners, if you're buying, if you're living in a farm or whatever, the biological diversity is is very very poor because we've farmed everything wall to wall. We don't leave trees standing. We don't have flowering plants. Sometimes a year, uh, everything's like bare except uh, maybe a, a, a monoculture, corn or soybean or something. That's not how nature's designed to function. So to answer your question, Joe, I plant. Like if I have a pumpkin field, every 120 feet, I plant 10 feet of flowering plants. And that's simply to attract beneficial insects, to give them a home so that they can go out and eat the bad guys. Uh, is that a 100% factor? No. But does it work? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, I put up with some vine borer. Um, if, you, if, you, if you're going to have five stalks and you lose three, that's a big deal. Uh, I never lose that many in my field, that percentage. But if you are, and then there, those buggers are hard to see because they drill in right at the soil surface and then they go into plant. You can't see it till the plant starts wilting and that's about too late. Mm -hmm. Unless someone else has a better remedy, um, maybe there's some home remedies in a garden scale that I'm not aware of. But that's a pesky one there. I'm yeah, I saw my first vine borer last year, my first mm -hmm. one ever. Mm -hmm. I was so upset. But mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing I could do was just I continued to use my organic methods. Yeah. But I, I do. I plant on the ends of my beds. I plant uh, my marigolds, my sunflowers, yeah. all of that on the ends of each each of my beds. Yeah. And so far, that's created some kind of barrier to keep mm -hmm. bugs away. And then I have a good friend here who sends me ladybugs. There you go. And I watched them basically battle it out with the Harley Quinn <laughs> bugs. It was great. <laughs> Biological warfare, we call that. <laughs> it made some really great footage because I got them like literally the ladybugs were beating them up. It was so great. Yeah, that's that's awesome to see. <laughs> yes. Now, <laughs> now, you had a pollinator project with Penn State. Yeah. Now, is that the same one you're talking about with the pollinators that what well, you developed or just something done, totally different? Yeah, we've done different things along our woods. Um, we plant strips to attract pollinating insects. Um, even between my high tunnels, I have 34 feet between them and I'll just plant flowers in there. Nice. Um, and, and, you know, that's part of my strategy to not have to use uh, insecticides, even organic insecticides. I mean, I don't, I don't even, when I say I don't use insecticides on my tomatoes, I'm saying nothing, no, no not even organic stuff. I'm treating everything with nutrition. Uh, and I'll just give you a quick example. Silica is one that's, it's probably not that hard to get for home, or, home gardeners, but if you can get silica, um, in a, either foliar feed it, or, or there's also, granular versions available that really helps protect against those soft bodied insects like aphids and uh, spider mites, the sucking insects, because when you have silica in the plant leaves, the plant leaves are too tough for them to even want to try to suck it out, suck out the, the sap. So there's a, some of the nutrients 
that sometimes are just missing in our soil or yeah, we just don't have them there. Or you don't have the microbes in your soil to make that nutrient available, which gets into a deeper topic, which you probably won't go into today. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 there's certain nutrients that can that can really help to defend against insects. So once your soil is healthy, then you don't really have to worry about these insects so much. Because Not as much, but, but you, okay. you know, you have to, you're going to have to visually, if you see it, if you don't have many problems, then you probably got it. But, you know, sometimes it's 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 hard because the these sap tests I told you about, mm -hmm. they cost $85 a piece. So oh. a gardener's not going to do that. You know, I got a quarter million dollars worth of tomatoes out here. So for me, that's nothing, uh, you yeah. know, to do every two weeks. So uh, so there again, there's that's some of the differences sometimes between being a commercial grower and also being a home gardener. But then again, you can look at your four tomato plants a lot more than I can watch my 10,000. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's there's different pros and cons about it all. So, okay, you go completely organic and you don't use insecticides or anything like that, pesticides. So, like, how much do you lose, if any? Uh, disease or insects? Yes. Well, first of all, I want to be clear. Uh, my statement of no pesticides is true. No organic pesticides, no pesticides. However, I'm not organic. I'm not certified organic. Uh, my, I could be. I could be, you know, ASAP. Uh, but that's not the lane. I'm, I'm regenerative. And uh, so I just want to put that out there. So... Yes, you can find a few spider mites in my high tunnel tomatoes. You can find a stink bug once in a while. You can see some leaf mold. There's a little bit there. Some varieties are much more susceptible. And some varieties by September, they're done. Yeah. My system. Some varieties are beautiful green yet and producing. So, you know, don't expect to see pristine, uh, you, know, you know, magazine cover uh, photos in the end of September. <laughs> uh, <laughs> being said i get a very high yield and uh you know to answer your question i don't know i'm just going to say a number i mean i might get five percent damage um ten percent but five percent with insects ten percent with disease really rough number I, i'm just yeah just give you an idea just but you plant in mass quantities so like if you did lose a few tomato plants or whatever it's not yeah. going to affect yeah. Your entire crop. You always lose a few to timber rot. You ever heard of that? Yes. Um, that worries me a little. That's kind of like vine borer, man. It's just like that timber rot gets in that vine. It's like, why did that happen? It's just like here and then 100 plants over there. And <coughs> I don't fully understand it. Um, I myself, that's something I'm not sure how to totally defend against it. But. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I teach, like, I try to tell everybody, I'm like, I plant in mass quantities. Uh -huh. So like, for instance, I don't plant a packet of peas. I mm -hmm. plant a pound of right. peas. And then if I lose a little bit of peas, it's not, or if my turkey flies over the <laughs> fence yeah. and decides yeah. to eat it, yeah. I still have peas in there. Yeah. So no, You're right. And unless you have a very limited area, you're doing the right thing. <laughs> now, how about something like powdery mildew? Oh yeah, um, that's pretty easy to uh, to defend against with uh, silica. The same thing with uh, that's a leaf thing. Uh, if you can spray it on, again, I work with commercial people who sell this stuff. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I see someone asked about spotter, a spotted lantern fly. You know, I don't really know the answer to that. I know that when when um, when the spotted lantern flies were headed our way. I mean, the, the university was like, oh, this is terrible and bad, 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 bad. And it, honestly, three years into this now here in Pennsylvania, it's only affected the, the vine crops like grapes pretty much. And the tree of heaven, they like, to, they like that tree. But that's a wild tree. It doesn't matter a whole lot. So they came through here in Pennsylvania in 2022. I mean, I would, there'd be 15, 20 times a day I'd be getting off my neck. And if any of you had them, they like to land in your neck because they think it's a tree, I guess. 
and <laughs> you're just back here. And you just have to keep swatting them away. 2023, hardly saw any until like the end of the year, just a few. And That's what's good. interesting is 30 to 40 miles west of us, because they're heading west, 2023 was their bad year. So it's like a front going through yeah. about 30 miles wild. That's why. That's about how it is in Pennsylvania anyway. So I don't know. We'll see what happens this year. But honestly, they have not been a problem for me. Uh, but I've heard of uh, grape growers is was where the most problem was. So, And I don't know a good way to control them buggers. Uh, I don't know. They are really bad in New Jersey. Are they? You know, even at a Rutgers football game, they're in the third oh, floor. No when way. My, when my son was at CHOP, they're all over the hospital. All, oh, all the way, to, all oh, way yeah. up to the top. It was insane. Yeah. I still couldn't They're, believe they went on the football. And people it said that they have seen them here, but I have not. Thank God. Yeah. Like, yeah, I I have they, not seen they it. They just turned out to be a nuisance for us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a good question because yeah. I didn't I was going to ask that today. So. <laughs> <laughs> Jersey Twister lives right next to me, and I'm like, oh, Philly, that's right. Yeah. Steve lives in Rolling Hills and Phil and Lancaster. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, now you also killing cancer cells. Oh yeah, <laughs> with with hemp, I believe. Yes, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's switching the topics a little bit. So in 2019, when it first became legal, I started growing CBD hemp and. To make a real long story short, I was contacted by Penn State College of Medicine, and they said, we're doing research on this. Can we use some of your, um, you know, your, your, your plants? I'm like, oh, yeah, that'd, that'd be awesome. What we initially started to look at was, is the growing of CBD, um, is there an effect that good quality soils have versus, we'll just say, conventional soils? And yes, we did find out there was an effect, but that research now here, we're 2024. I actually was just communicating with them today. Um, that research has continued. And I got to tell you, I think there's some really cool things on the horizon. It takes a long time for anything to get out. You know, public it takes years, but we, they literally killed colon cancer cells in a Petri dish from CBD hemp that I grew here in my farm. Yes, that's, that's quite exciting. Uh, I love that. Boom. Dude. That is awesome. <laughs> they're, they're working on other things too. Um, I guess the thing that really surprised me is that's coming from a pretty what I, what can I say a, an academic institution. You know, we talk about big pharma, <laughs> and uh, I was like, I'm surprised you guys are even doing this. And they said, Well, you know, we're trying to be a little quiet about it now. And I was when I've been there, I'm sure I'm going there in two weeks again. They have a whole day uh, to give us the updates. The young, I'm going to call them kids. I'm 60 years old. So the the the, the grad students and the, the, the new doctors and the new researchers, I'm impressed. Uh, they, they're looking at some of this alternative stuff. And now they've actually, they, they were focusing mostly on CBD, but now they've actually changed the name of their unit there that they're calling, they're talking, calling it plant-based medicines. How cool is that? Because yeah. we, know, we know that all plants are medicine to right. some degree or another. And, you know, we're starting to hear these terms. Food is medicine. And I've been using that, but I've since changed to food is health. And and to me, we, we have to look at this. I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to get political here, but the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, do they do anything with food anymore? I know. It makes my brain hurt. Exactly. So we'll leave it at that because that's not our topic tonight. I'm just saying that we have been um, essentially bought out by, by Big Pharma. And what's exciting to me is we just have to relearn what our grandparents knew or our grandparents right. knew. And, and it's, it's kind of there. But it got to all be retested again. I get that. <clears throat> but um, but all this to say is uh, I'm working with Penn State College of Medicine, and good for them. I'm proud of what they're doing. And maybe someday, you know, we'll be able to, <clears throat> you know, treat some of these diseases and these cancers more naturally. That is awesome about the CBD. <clears throat> like, that's the smart thing. I, 
yeah, I percent believe in. So that's yeah, really I see, cool. I see this question, how do you get the government to approve hemp nationwide? So currently um, it is approved nationwide. The, defe the definition of hemp is any cannabis plant that's less than 0.3% THC. Anything above that is in the marijuana classification uh, or schedule one drug. Uh, and again, I don't want to get sidetracked here. Uh, just even my own CBD business at cedarmeadow.farm, we have, we've been shut down by Facebook several times. We've been shut down by credit card companies uh, because they'll send us this like email. You're violating our schedule one drug policy. Like, no, we're not. No, we're not. But, you know, you don't pick up the phone and call Facebook. Yeah. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. You email and you email and maybe you'll get a response. And then in the meantime, you're losing business right. because so, you can't contact anybody. So, and we were shut down by four credit card companies to take credit cards, you know, to make online sales. And they'll just, they'll sign you up. Yep, you're good. And then you get an email. Uh, you violated our schedule one drug policy. Now we got some, some companies now <clears throat> are like embracing it. Said, no, we're going to, we're here for you, man. So we got that figured out. But uh, there, there's, there's continued stigma over it. And um, that could be a conversation for another day. But hey, CBD. The problem of it is, is it's not well regulated on the uh, retail side, and there's some junk stuff out there. Yeah. I know because even Penn State, they found three, three brands that they just randomly true, they randomly tested all of many that had zero CBD in it, because uh, you don't have to. I can like if someone want to be a dealer for me uh, to to sell my CBD, I could give you a twelve pack, and you don't have to do anything. You can just start selling it. But for me to grow it, I got to sign up with the state. I got to pay for a registration fee. I got to get fingerprinted, all 10 fingers. I have to do a ba FBI background check. And then the just state has to grow it? They have to, huh? And you said just to grow it? Yeah. Yeah, just to grow CBD. Nuts. And then the state has to come out. They have to test it before harvest. And then they have to say, yep, okay, you're good. It's not marijuana. Yeah, we have to do all that stuff. Uh, it's just it's just part of part of what it is, so. Wow. Now, can you eat cover crops? Oh, yes. Certain ones. <clears throat> Hairy vets doesn't taste very good. Uh, the grasses <laughs> aren't very good. Humans don't eat, don't do good with grass. That's for animals. But the ones you want to try <clears throat> is like um, canola or oil seed rape. Uh, that the flowers, when there's yellow flowers come out, oh, they're so good. It looks weird eating flowers because we're not used to it. But I like to, I'll just pull it on people. I'll be walking out of the field there with me and I'll start eating the flowers. I'm like, what are you doing? I said, well, try it. And they're like, oh, this is not, not too bad. We grow <laughs> peas. Uh, Corky, we grow peas as a cover crop. Yeah. Uh, so they're, of course, you know, they're nice and, and nice young tendrils. I love peas. Uh, <laughs> they're so good. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you can, there, is, there are some that you can eat. Actually, I don't know if you've heard of Chef Dan Barber or not. He's uh, up in north of, of, these, of uh, New York City, very high end restaurant. He actually has cover crops on his menu, uh, <clears throat> like peas oh, wow. and, uh, and things like that. Yeah, nice. he's into all this stuff. That's cool. Now, if you're growing in a raised bed, what kind of cover crops would you grow? So if you're just starting out, I would go, like I mentioned earlier, with spring oats and, uh, <clears throat> and radishes. That's easy. That is definitely the easiest. You've changed um, my mind on a lot of this, by the way. I no, just might do radishes. Try it. <laughs> try it. Everyone has to have their own story. I'm just giving you suggestions um, that are pretty well uh, well accepted. <clears throat> uh, but then again, you know, try to, to grow some, uh, you know, I, most everyone has a garden, has peas, but you can grow, you don't have peas everywhere in your garden. It's a, It could be a cover crop. Get a cheap variety or buy a cover crop. There are actually garden stores now that sell cover crop packets of seed. So yeah, be able to get the more popular ones. And, and, and I mean, you start getting into, you know, level two and three, your hairy batch, your cereal rye, uh, buckwheat. Um, and then you can really get uh, a flax is a good one to grow. Flax is mycorrhizal fungi association. Uh, we didn't talk about that, but uh, that's something that's good for your soil. Uh, yeah. 
that, that's another one to get plaques and um and uh and then you know just do a little research out there uh a lot of times it's limited to what you can get your hands on uh so a cover crop can be anything that's a plant that's grow covering the soil uh we try to stay away from our you know our typical uh garden cash garden edible crops so we have the rotation effect and so forth but in the summer you know, like I said, if you can get some sorghum sedan grass, it may grow eight feet tall, but man, that's a lot of biomass. You chop it down in the fall and then let it, you know, decompose on top there. Uh, cow peas planted with that is a good match. Um, so there's there's some ideas for you, Joe, to get started. Now, I can't, I couldn't even believe how after all these years with the microbes and mycorrhizal, what you have in your garden, but do you have a microscope? So, um, I don't. I'm looking around here. I don't see it right now. <clears throat> I have a little microscope that I can hook into my laptop computer. Yeah, it was one of those cheap deals that I couldn't resist and got it. I have thought a couple times I've been on Amazon and I people have told me, oh, you got to get this microscope. Honestly, I just don't have time for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but that is pretty cool. I'm always fascinated by it. And those of you who are into that, the amount of life that's in a little grain of soil is amazing. Uh, I would say, especially if you have kids, man, what a teachable moment. What a teachable moment. Um, I would say do it. So to answer your question, I do not have a microscope. Maybe I will someday, but I, don't know about it. <laughs> I can't even imagine how much life you have in that soil for after all these years using yeah. cover crops. That would ask, it really has to be fascinating if you ever had a chance. Yeah. <laughs> What kind of heirloom, what other vegetables do you grow? So I mentioned the tomatoes. Right. Uh, and then I'll break it down for the squash, winter squash, butternut, spaghetti, acorn, delicata, kabocha. Those five are the main ones I grow for winter squash. And then <clears throat> for the pumpkins, I grow everything from the basic Halloween size uh, orange pumpkin down to the real small ones that are the size of a baseball. And then I have heirloom, uh, pumpkins, squash, decorative, fall decorative, ornamental. Um, 2022, I had 120 varieties. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I backed off a little bit. I go through these phases. Well, I got to try this. It gets addictive. I mean, as any of you grow heirloom tomatoes, you just can't help ordering a couple seeds of, of this stuff just to try because it looks so good in that magazine. Yes. On, on online or whatever. You just kind of got to try it. Uh, but, you know, the nice thing about my situation is last year I dialed a fact about 75 varieties, but I just planted three different plantings of a mix of those 75, essentially about 25 varieties each where I mixed all the seeds together. All right. So I mix the smaller size together, the medium size, and the large size together. Went out and planted them because <clears throat> the trend now in marketing is to sell a mix. So we're able to harvest it as a mix, and then we can uh, then we can sell it in our boxes and everything in a mix. So it's not as hard as it seems, but I found just as in diversity is a good thing for 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 your cover crops. Diversity in squash and so forth is a good thing as well because <clears throat> if anybody ever grows squash commercially or yourself, sometimes you get a packet of seeds that just doesn't grow. Yeah. Sometimes don't grow. And it's the same. Um, uh, and sometimes you only have 50% germ. Well, if you have all different kinds of varieties mixed and one doesn't grow here and there, it doesn't matter. It fills in. Uh, so it gives you a better look and feel. That gives you better weed control. A lot of good, good reasons for doing it, but that's how I do it at scale. And you're right. Like I see a lot of seed companies now doing things as mixes. Mm -hmm. It's all like, especially salads, like sa yeah. salad yeah. bowl mix. And there's a, this mix and, and it does, it creates the best yep. leaf lettuce to mm -hmm. eat. So yep. I see a lot of that. Did you ever um, grow one of those large, large pumpkins? Like the no. plant mm -hmm. Maybe maybe uh, 30 years ago when I had more time, I tried it once. Got got some varieties, but that takes a lot of effort to get anything significant out of it. And uh, that's not me. 
<laughs> I, I listened to a guy talk. I listened to a guy talk once. He grew. He was he was a uh, retired professional championship pumpkin grower. <laughs> he said he spent forty hours a week growing six plants. Wow. Oh, that, no, that's that's not me either. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's yeah. definitely not me doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't have to like I don't I don't have the time and dedication right. to sit and watch six plants. I'd rather plant an entire garden yeah. full of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. yeah. They must sing to it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean jeez. You're gonna make me cough. <laughs> How about rotating crops? So um, it's a very good thing practice to do. Uh, gardeners can do it as well. It's a little inconvenient sometimes. You have your favorite spots for your favorite vegetables, but try to. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Uh, and yeah, that's that's just you know try to plan things out that you can switch it up. And it's just that simple. Uh, do what you can in that regard. Yeah, I try to rotate as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um and rotate but i have such a small garden yeah i know so it's hard to do that with my tomatoes i haven't rotated my tomatoes in like four or five years and there's a school of thought out there not to get too much in the weeds here but uh if you get your soil dialed in to a specific species that can work the other side of the coin is you know if you build up certain diseases in the soil I think the key is if you plant cover crops between the, you know, when your tomatoes are done, that's going to help mitigate that. Um, so I'm, I'm actually attempting now for my high tunnel tomatoes to grow in perpetuity. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm setting myself up. I just moved them last year with what I know now. Uh, and I'm, that's my goal is not to move, not to rotate. That sounds directly opposite until what a lot of people share and i'm not saying i'm right but it's a theory that i'm testing so we'll see <clears throat> yeah, well, that makes sense so because if your soil's good mm -hmm. why do you need to rotate like your soil's good and nature doesn't do rotation nature has diversity and living year round there's two things soil mm -hmm. cover well the third thing uh if you do all that and can grow food in that you probably won't have to rotate yeah, that, that you, makes so much sense. What do you think of artificial intelligence? Well, uh, with any new technology that comes along, I mean, I remember when the, I've heard, I've heard back in the day when the radio came out, there was concerns about that. When television comes out, there was concerns. When the internet came out, oh, you know, here we go. It's the same deal. It's, it can be used for good. It can be used for evil. Uh, that's the simplest way I can say it. Uh, I just think that you just can't trust, uh, you gotta be very careful, uh, information that you can't verify, um, as cool as it is. And I, and I like it, I use it a little bit, but I'm not going to rely on that hundred percent. Um, my take is it's technology. Mm -hmm. If I feel confident, it can serve me in a justifiable way. I'm not afraid of it. Um, in agriculture, there's a lot of AI coming out that's that's uh, very helpful. Um, but I think we all know that there's it's uh, uh, it's two sides of that. Yeah. <clears throat> now, how about the seed depth when planting cover crops? Typically, uh, a seed depth is um, for your spring oats, your radishes um peas about an inch and it's when you have good soil seed depth is not as much of an issue if you have soil that is tend to proning to crust after you plant it's all you know first of all it's really tilled up fine you plant and then it rains and it crusts if you have like a radish plant an inch deep it may not be able to pop through that crust unless you go out there and try to break the crust. But a good quality soil won't crust, or if it's covered, it won't crust. So um, planting cover crops is not that critical for seeding depth. <clears throat> I will say later in the fall, you can plant deeper just because the ground's warm and it'll come up. But uh, you know, if you, 
uh, don't have any way to irrigate and it's bone dry, you know, you might want to plant deeper to find moisture. That would be a reason to go a little deeper, just to get it going, not knowing when it's going to rain. But I would say cover crop depth, planting depth, it's not a critical thing like lettuce would be. Um, you know, some of our other crops are smaller seeds that, you know, you don't want to get them too deep, but you don't want to put them on top either. And I'll just say too quickly, I should mention, you can broadcast radishes and spring oats even hairy vets to a degree on top of soil. And you can put a cover a little bit of uh, mulch or something on it, and next rain it'll grow. Uh, if you have a rain or two, you know, obviously if it doesn't rain, you're going to grow. Yeah. So some things can be scattered on top, but rake it in a little bit if you can. You might as well do it right. Yeah, Northeast Ohio, if it doesn't rain here, there's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Do you rotate your cover crops? No, um, I generally plant multi-species mixes, and that's a form of rotation. Um, so now, having said that, once you get to the middle of October, your cover crop species of uh, available plants that are practical to grow at that time drops off dramatically. You can only plant like cereal rye uh, after October the 15th. I'm going to say generally above I-70. Uh, but before that, there's other things. Uh, you have to know, you know, what your area is, what the planting windows are. And I'm not going to go into all that because it depends if you're in Florida or it depends if you're in Maine. Uh, so yeah. you'll, you'll know from your local area. Uh, talk to someone if you don't know. And uh, basically a rule of thumb is before your average first killing frost, um, like a month before, most anything can be planted as a cover crop. When you get to that date of the average first killing frost in the fall, then you're getting limited just to cereal rye or triticale or wheat or, or something like that. If anybody has any questions in the chat, this is a good time to put them up. Just make sure they're all in caps so we can answer them. Uh, let me see. So we had a question before. What is the role of green manure cover crops in soil health? So was- green, green manure... And the way I've used to be here, and it is actually cover crops, um, where they may, may the, the term a lot of times associated with turning them in, uh, plowing them under, tilling them in with a rototiller. That's how I'm familiar with the, uh, <clears throat> the, the term uh, green manure. So pretty much everything we've been talking about applies to the green manure, uh, as I understand. Um, let me see. Another question was, do cover crops increase soil organic matter? And the answer is yes. And why is the carbon footprint important? Part, what, what was that exact why question? Why is the carbon footprint important for like what state by state? Important in corn? And, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I had something in my throat too. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, why is it? Why is the carbon footprint important for, for sustainability? sustainability? Okay. Mm-hmm. I want to know exactly what that question was because that could be very broad. When you talk about the carbon footprint, we're talking about carbon that is is released or saved in any different practice product, mm-hmm. or whatever. It's a very very broad question. Um, one thing that, and it depends how you figure it. Um, corn is a very good sequester of carbon. I can tell you that it's one of the best. Uh, the corn and hemp is one of the best ways to sequester CO2 and put it into soil as carbon. But if you till your soil up, then you're releasing that back into the atmosphere. Uh, Cover crops, they take CO2 out of the atmosphere, put it in the soil as carbon. Uh, So you can argue that a good no-till cover crop farmer growing corn, their carbon footprint is very small. Uh, it really is. Now, soybeans, not as much. Soybeans don't take in much uh, uh, carbon. They don't add much carbon. They actually burn it up a lot of times because they're a legume. Uh, so their carbon footprint probably a little bit bigger. Now, if you start adding in all the inputs that it takes to grow corn, the nitrogen in particular, and the conventional farmers, you know, the different things that they put on there, then that makes that carbon footprint a little bit bigger. 
So I don't know really how to answer the question specifically to corn, but I will say that corn is a very good sequester of carbon. But how you grow that corn is the difference between if it's, you know, how big the carbon footprint is. So that's the best way I can answer that question without knowing more. Question. Now, this is a little controversial, a little bit. Um, people, they, they're trying to tell people now that when you garden in your backyard, that you're contributing to the carbon footprint of the world, that it's a horrible thing to do is to garden in your backyard. What is your opinion on that? Oh, I generally don't agree with that because you're growing something. Anytime you're growing something, that's good. And, uh, you know, as I referenced earlier about how the soil is designed to function, if humanity would leave, the planet would be green. I can promise you that. It would be green um, and very quickly. So if, if you're growing, I mean, if you look at a, a yard, grass, that sequesters some carbon, but you're spending, you're cutting it every week. So there are your lawnmowers emitting carbon, right? CO2. Mm -hmm. Some people put way too much fertilizer on your yard. I don't, to me, that's stupid. But that's me. Uh, <clears throat> so the carbon footprint of a yard um, is probably going to be higher than a garden. So I'm just assuming, you know, pretty much all things being equal. Now, if you have your garden and you're growing cover crops and you're not rototilling it, then you score more points. And then absolutely your garden is going to be a net uh, net gain of carbon or, a, you know, it's, it's the carbon footprint will be very small. So. I don't agree with the statement. Um, I think good gardening is going to be better for the planet. 100%. <laughs> where I go, I was reading about how we are increasing our carbon footprint by gardening in our backyard. <laughs> I don't get that. What's wrong with these people? <laughs> but yes. <laughs> now, what do you, for seed starting? Yeah. What do you use for seed starting? Uh, seed starting? So, um, my tomato plants are started with a friend of mine who grows them, so I personally don't do that. Um, on my own farm, for my cash crops and for my uh, cover crops, we're going to go on a little bit of a rabbit trail here. But I do, if, if anybody has heard of the practice of Korean natural farming, I follow a little bit of that. Uh, IMOS is what we call it, indigenous microorganism. Uh, a, a solution where we take soils on our farm that are like the best and we put them <clears throat> we put them and uh, mix them up <clears throat> give them a little bit of food for 10 days put them in a sack in water aerate it get the microbes and bacteria and fungi activated and we put that on our seed so probably people heard of compost tea it's not really a compost tea but it sort of is we put that on the seed. That's our seed treatment. Seed treatment. We're using indigenous organisms that we're trying to re-inoculate into our field. So it's a very, very short story, but that's the answer to your question. Um, your thoughts on using mustard as a cover crop and tilling it in for nematode control? If you get the right variety that was designed and, and uh, bred for that, yes. That that is. Uh, if, if you have, if you need, if you have nematodes, and that's a problem. Yeah, you do have to till that in to make it work. It's uh, glucosinolates is the, the natural compound. Uh, they say it's kind of like cyanide. Uh, so for to the nematodes anyway. So yes, um, that's a very good natural way to control nematodes if that's a problem you have. That's pretty interesting. I never ever even thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. But the mustard must be pretty potent to... Yeah, it is a special kind. Caliente is one. Uh, there's a couple others. Um. <clears throat> yeah, and then we were just learning about, I was just learning about how the watermelon radish, how you can use the leaves as a natural Ooh. pesticide in your garden oh. because it's hot, you know, so. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Most bugs don't particularly care for that. Mm -hmm. I'm just going over some questions here. Any other questions? Make sure they're all in caps. Now, what 
the future of gardening, future of farming. Do you mm -hmm. think that has to do – what do you see – I, th I see so much change, just like everything's changing from now. Mm -hmm. What do you say? So what we just talked about, um, trying to understand the soil better uh, and trying to maximize what we already have in the ground. So, you know, learning about – and you, I see you put the website up there. I, I, I don't know. I've, I've not been on that particular website, but there's no doubt about it. That's becoming more popular. So I'm not going to go into the details, the technicalities of it. It is, it is somewhat, uh, uh, you know, strategic and what you need to do. You don't want to waste your time and not get it right. Uh, so that comes down to it. Now, <clears throat> in commercial agriculture, there's starting to be more and more what we call bugs in a jug. In other words, <clears throat> you know, taking this stuff and uh, commercially, you know, rip, uh, multiplying it and then selling it. That's good, but you're dealing with biology, and sometimes from the time it's made till it gets to the field, will it survive? Is it still alive? How do you know if it's live or not? Um, but I think, why not make my own if it's not too hard? Uh, and this is where this IMOS thing seems to work well. Um, and and so that's, that's where I... Uh, that's where I'm headed. I see the question about biochar. Perfect question. Where's the future going? <clears throat> I would be uh, guilty of saying a couple years ago, I don't need biochar. My soil is good enough. I've now recanted. <laughs> I could use a little biochar to take me to the next level. Uh, so I'm looking into it. I'm studying it. Just talking to a guy today about it. I'm using some biochar um, in my tomatoes. Um, I'm actually using a, I built my own biochar filter, water filter, like a carbon filter for your house. Yeah. It's, I, I built my own, uh, and since there's no 300 gallon per minute capability in the market, I built my own for my irrigation for my high tunnels and, uh, still tweaking that a little bit, but, uh, so yes, biochar, but there's good biochar and bad biochar. Yeah. Uh, so Again, not enough time tonight to go into it, but uh, I think biochar is definitely something that uh, you might want to look into. We just had Kathleen Draper on, mm, so yeah. she was she was amazing. I just learned <laughs> so much about biochar; it was crazy. I'm like, I didn't know I could feed it to my chickens. Oh yeah, oh yeah, garden, like, everything. Yeah, everything. Everything. It's yep. awesome. Yep. Well. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, this was a, this is awesome because I think most of the people here have not used cover crops. Yeah, or right. knew, knows how to use it. You know, mm -hmm. like oh, I just had uh, just like uh, Gail said before. I just had I just start. I have my garden right now. I didn't till because everybody yeah. is used to tilling, 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 and. Uh, this is. I hope this is beneficial for everybody here, and it's something I'm going to really go for. Same thing with biochar. I think it, I'm actually really you know, excited for the fall, so I can put yeah. my cover crops on because I'm curious how it's going to work, and I'm sure it's going to work just fine. But it'll be my first time doing it, so you, everybody has their own story, and you. It's like riding a bike; you got to start somewhere, and you'll learn. You'll trust me; you will change. Uh, you'll learn. Uh, Everybody's situation is unique, and if I can just leave with that, that's the key here. Uh, I, I appreciate people getting excited about this, but give yourself some patience. Be a student. Stay curious. Keep learning. Uh, that's the key here to be successful. Thank you so much, uh, as Farmer Steve, for coming on and hanging out with us today. I really appreciate it, and all your information was wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for telling it at a place that we can all understand it. So all right. thank all right. you. <laughs> Welcome. All right. Thank you so much, Dave. We'll talk soon. Yep. Take care. Yep. That was awesome, wasn't it? Yes, that was so <laughs> great. And he is so nice. That's another thing. Like, I just I love interviewing people that have such a great personality. He is one of them that's just he's so nice and informational. Yeah, so much info. I want to keep him here for longer. Actually, you know what? I'm looking at questions. One second. I still have this much more to go. Oh, my gosh. <laughs>
crazy. But you got to um, be prepared. You got to be prepared at all angles. <laughs> and you were. And you guys, I'm so sorry I hadn't been here last week. You have no idea what I had been through, y'all. <laughs> like, it's been a horrible week of sickness, of sickness, of sickness. By the way, Joe, how'd everything go yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> It went all right. <laughs> I, sh I show you guys a picture of me yesterday. <laughs> you get a good laugh out of it. One second. But yeah, so I'm so glad you guys enjoyed this interview. I love and I really enjoy talking with people that are like number one in the field. That is like you get the most information out of that. And um, thank you for scoring this wonderful interview, Joe, because this was this guy is awesome. So he's the got pretty much the godfather of cover crops, you know, because really it hasn't really been out there since 2010. And he's been using it since 19, well, 85 or something. 80, yeah. 80. yeah. So this is a picture of me after my colonoscopy. <laughs> well. I'm it all went you. well. <laughs> By the way, you guys, he doesn't have to have another one for like 10 years. So everything looked great. 10. And we're, we are all fortunate that he didn't have the video. <laughs> He's showing us. <laughs> okay, Joe, lay on your side. <laughs> That's horrible. I'm so glad you spared us all. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm doing better. Thank you, Jane Doe. It's been horrible, but we're recovering. And then on top of being sick, I got this cold on top of it. I'm just, y'all, I they, I need like a medicine, like a, what is it, a medicine doctor. I can't think of it right now, but yeah, I need like a smoke tent and I need to like rid myself of all <laughs> this negative sickness. I'm so sick of being sick. It's like horrible. And I'm not the only one. My son is still a little bit sick. And my husband is like, we're just done with it. Done. So artificial intelligence is actually becoming a really cool thing. <clears throat> um, so with artificial intelligence, this is pretty funny. Watch this. <laughs> You're going to laugh. I didn't show anybody this. Let me see if I could do this. Um, <laughs> who is Grow Big TV? Y'all, he showed me this and I was shocked. One second. Yeah, look at that. We are on this database. It gives a whole thing about who we are, how many accounts we have. It's like insane. And it should talk. It's very cool. YouTube channel here or here. Oh. Might have to start it over. Who is Grow Big TV? I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean by just started over. Do you want me to repeat my previous answer or give you more information about Grow Big TV? I want information about Grow Big TV. Okay, it's not working the way I want it to. <laughs> Let me try this again. Who is Grow Big TV? I already answered that question. Oh my God. <laughs> TV is a YouTube channel about gardening, health, and sustainability. The hosts are Corky and Joseph Koslovsky, who are plant and fungi enthusiasts. They also have a TikTok account and a Facebook group where they share more content and interact with their fans. If you want to learn more, you can watch their videos here or here. Is there anything else I can help you with? 
No, have a good night. <laughs> anyway, I didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was really cool, guys. Like, you know, it was funny. So, uh, so we got another great guest on Thursday. I'll tell you guys that in another video. And uh, guys, we got some great stuff going on. And I think this is a good time to tell you we are about our fearsome foursome. It's going to be pre-recorded though. So yeah, I'm like, okay, one, I'm really nervous about this because I'm just nervous because we're going to have the top people on YouTube in this fearsome foursome. And then two, I'm kind of, a, I, I'm like, I, I'm excited, but I'm nervous. Like, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. I didn't mean so to interrupt, but I'm just we, like. We plan to do a fearsome foursome every month. So it's going to be a group of four people. Most of you people know. So this fearsome foursome is going to be Gardner Scott. Yep. Chili Chump. Yep. Mary's Heirloom Seeds. And Tony from Simple, Simple Flea Gardening. I freaking so, love Tony. You guys, this is going to be like the best. This is going to be the best. I'm going to love and, this. And that's going to be March 23rd. It's going to be pre-recorded because we got people from the UK on. So if you guys want to check out Chili Chomp, wow. You know, Chili Chomp is what an awesome channel. Just look at the viewers from him, Tony, Gardner, Scott, and, yeah. and Maris Heirloom Seeds. Um, we have other people we're working on because I want to make sure all four could get along because not everybody has the same views. You know, yeah. you want every, we want a great conversation. Even if they all don't have the same views, it's still great if you can respectfully get your point across and not argue. Just be, you know. But I, they're all going to have pretty much the same views on stuff they're all yep. who they are but I, I can't wait it's gonna be great it's gonna be great i can't wait for it to happen and you guys to see it and we're also working on an interview he's in another country right now i'm not going to say his name right away but he's in another country and his uh he grew up next to burpee so he was a fertilizer guy big time guy well, now he's all about the soil. Feed the soil, not the plant. Instead, yeah. all before it was all feed the plant, not the soil. So that's going to be an awesome interview. Because I have a lot of questions about fertilizer. You know? So at the same time, I have a lot of questions about soil health. <laughs> right. So it's going to be a good one for everybody to listen to that one. That, that, that interview... It's a, the whole circle of what we're surrounding on this channel to put everything together. And talking about biochar and your cover crops, I'm telling you right now, it's all about the microbes in a garden and how to store it. So when you have your biochar that keeps it there and then you have the microbes go there, that's how you grow food. Right. And that's what we're talking about, how to. From the beginning of gardener to the most advanced gardener, that is how you grow food. And uh, I'm freaking excited. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be great. And um, we have like a lot of cool things coming up for you guys. Um, I, the reason, yeah, I'm nervous about our fearsome four, but today, you guys, I had Terry King come into my side chat. <laughs> And I got all flabbergasted, <laughs> and he, he posted. He said, "Oh, you're getting all flabbergasted!" Like he, he posted that in the side chat. I'm like, yeah, you're freaking Terry King, and you just came into my side chat. I was like shocked. You guys don't understand. Like, I watch YouTube a lot, so most of these people are like celebrities to me. So when I'm interviewing, I'm I get kind of like a little choked up a little bit. <laughs> Um, so Chris, Chris White goes, I can't even read that in my classes. I asked co-pilot who is Colonel William M. Wyatt. I'm humbled by the output. Wow. <laughs> it's a 
it's kind of crazy when you and there's Tony's book. So Tony's guys, just let you guys know, you guys helped Tony to get number one in the UK and the US on day one with his new book. So day one, boom. It's up because of you guys and how you guys bought his book, which is totally awesome. And thank you guys. Oh, we forgot. And my gardener. We got you get 10% off and my gardener. Yes. Um, on our what's scrolling down there, there's like a lot of information. Okay. And my gardener. You can go to my gardener right now and you can use hashtag grow big and get 10% off your order. Or you can go to Mary's Heirloom Seeds as well. You can go there and use grow big. Don't use the hashtag, just use grow big. You can also get 10% off there. We also have memberships now. So if you're interested in being a member of grow big TV, it's um, as low as two ninety nine dollars a month and you can be a member and um, we have a lot of fun. So. Hey guys, it, uh, becoming a member, it helps us keep going. And something with super chats and stuff like that. And I know we had a $10 super chat in the beginning. And it's somebody I have no idea, but he was really sick and had a nosebleed. And you guys said, go tell him. You said, go to the hospital right away because you had a nosebleed. <laughs> anyway, uh, I never seen you before in a chat, but I want to say thank you for the $10, $10 super chat. And thank you guys for being so concerned about his uh, abouts. But uh Anyway, those memberships and donations, they really help. And yes. a lot more than you guys couldn't even imagine. Um, and also check out and my gardener, Mary's Heirloom Seeds. All you have to do is use Grow Big Without the Hashtag. And we get a little portion of that back. And that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, so, I think there's something wrong with me. Because even after I got all these seeds, Joe sent me seeds. I was still on M.I. Gardener and Mary <laughs> looking for seeds. What is wrong with me? <laughs> but you know, I still go and I still look to see if there's something that I might need. So it's worth it if you use the hashtag grow big uh, for M.I. Gardener or use grow big for Mary's heirloom. You get your 10% off and it's so worth it. It is worth it. Especially, I mean, you could get five or six packets of seeds and get a nice little discount and it'll make you happy. Awesome. And thank you, Jane, for doing that for anything I get from Venmo or PayPal goes directly 50, 50 between the both of us. Jersey said she's guilty. It's not an addiction. It's a calling says Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many Mike, how many packets of seeds not have you won? Not just from our channel, but from everybody else. YouTube loves you. Don't make sure you don't step away at all. Just keep on going, letting it roll. Keep on letting it roll. Oh man, <laughs> there's just you guys. There's so much stuff that I want to plant. I am so excited to get this season on the roll, man. Going because I just got so much stuff in my head. I just hope I have enough trays. To get everything started, I might have to do a lot of direct sewing this year. <laughs> and Jay Dixon, um, you left a comment, but I missed it in the beginning of the chat about Gardner Scott. Um, can you post that again? Because I totally missed that comment in the, in the very, very beginning. Um, I was reading for like five things at five times. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what? <laughs> So our new interview, our, our new time is eight o'clock. Hope you guys like that. It's gonna uh, time change next week. I and can't uh, believe that what is flown by? Way too it really fun. has. And I'm I can't wait, you guys. This weather, like I just got a taste of it today. Yesterday and today it was like seventy two degrees, and I was just like, I got a taste. But it's supposed to snow on Sunday. Really? <laughs> I'm not ready. I don't want it to snow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool, Jersey. That's awesome. It's her first time, uh, first year starting seeds indoors. Well, good. I hope you get a lot of good, healthy plants out there. 
Yes, Wanda. Well, I'm in Northeast Ohio. So I mean, one minute it can be 80 degrees. And then by the end of the evening, it could be 32 degrees with snow in the air. Like, welcome to Ohio. Okay, you know, I'm going to post one Serena joke. Only one joke, Serena, that I will, I will post, okay? So I can't um, post jokes all left and right. You and Jay were posting jokes the whole time, but I can't. I, we're doing an interview. We can't look at jokes, you know? So here's Serena's joke of the day. Which vegetable do you want to grow unless you want a huge water bill? A leeks. <laughs> so there's Serena's joke. Okay. Um, let me see. I'm just looking at any other questions. <clears throat> yeah, that's right, Wanda. Um, yeah, it's probably why we are sick too. It's like today it went from 70 and now it's cold again. It's like really cold tonight. So I don't know, man. Hey, LP, thank oh. you for coming in. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Jay. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And every time I'm I'm on Gardner, his live, his chat, um, you're always showcasing our channel, and we really appreciate that, Jay. Uh, I know Cork and I talk about it, and uh, we're glad you're doing better to make it these lives, and we know you're bad on a lot of things over there. So thank you so much. And Jane Doe, Jane Doe, thank you guys. You guys are the best mods. You guys are posting stuff, looking yeah. things up left and right. Yeah, and I know amazing. where – and I know our, all our guests are like, wow, because they comment to us, who are those <laughs> mods? And, the, you know, they post stuff like comments, and I'm like, that's two mods on internet. <laughs> you guys are the greatest. And it's so helpful for us all to learn. Yeah, so oh, definitely. Okay, guys. Well, thank you guys for a great live. Um, share this out if you have a chance. And you know, help each other out. That's what works. That's what it's all about. Grow big, twenty four. Oh, contest, contest, contest. We didn't talk about the contest. Yeah, there's so much stuff that we have to talk about. So, yeah, uh, I forgot about just, it. Just quick, um, we got the six contests. You guys can still register. Um, use hashtag Grow Big twenty four. Right? Was that the quirky? I already forgot. Yeah, my mind's going. Mm-hmm. Grow, hashtag grow big 24 under each video now if you're already starting okay. in the video guys you have to say that you're in that you want to be in the competition so make sure that your comment says that otherwise we will not consider that you're in so just make sure you say that in the comments you have to make three videos one with the seed packet or one or if you have already planted it just make sure you tell me you got to make three videos. So the beginning when you have the seed packet, one in the middle of the season, one at the end of the season. So just think about your end of the season. You guys basically have until September. So if you want to start now and you want to put your finished product for a radish, you want to do your radish all season long, you want to grow 5,000 radishes, we don't care. You got to show it on video. That's all. Show and, it, yeah, um, you have to show the basically the beginning, the middle, and the end. And there's stipulations to like the radish and all that. It can't be split, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, check out the videos um, to know the complete details. And um, yeah, and yeah, I can't wait. It's gonna be really cool to see everybody's you know videos on it. Um, just make sure that you're using the hashtag um, so we can e find you easily. That's how we'll do it. Um, you can use any hashtag with with your videos. So if you are a, a YouTuber and that's what you do, you make videos, that's fine. Just make sure you use our hashtag along with your other hashtags so we can find you better. And, um, yeah, it's going to be great. I can't wait to see everybody's big vegetables. And there's been a couple of videos already made, so it's just pretty cool. But we want, And if you need Dr. Weichi Tomato or Do, uh, Peter Pepper, I do have a couple seeds, but I'm not giving, it's not going to be a pack. It's going to be like five seeds. So, uh, Ginger Ninja said, how are they measured? So a Peter Pepper, you, you, a tape ruler is the best because they could swerve a little up. up. <laughs> you got to kind of look a little weird <laughs> shaped. 
and you just got to measure it from the top to the bottom to the base. You know, <laughs> you got my uh, drift there. Um, the watermelon radish, if it splits, you're out. You got to watch each video. So that's the most important. Watch the video because that's where you got to get, you know, you can't just say, okay, what do I need to do? Watch the video. It's only three, four minute, five minute videos. Uh, if they split, you're out. That's a competition. Who uh, There's not many contests out there that give money away. Each winner gets $100, and second and third price will get some seeds or something like that. Um, so the, it's pretty cool. So it's pretty cool. We had naughty version, D. Naughty version. Because, well, it's tough doing these contests, and everybody has the same plan. Because a lot of people are looking to get the edge, to cheat a little bit. I'm not saying you are. But some people do because a hundred dollars is a hundred dollars. So we got to make sure the sure the rules are the rules. Um, the zucchini, right? You, I don't want a yellow zucchini, right? So there's little rules to that too. That has to be a darkish green. And if it changes on one side and the rest of the zucchini is dark green, we know because it just laid on the ground. You know, so there's you know. You gotta watch the rules. There's so. rules, rules to it all. So, like I said, just make sure you're watching the video. And when you do that, please make sure when you say in, in the comments that you're actually in. I'm in. Like I want to do this. Don't just leave a comment and not say that because then we won't know for sure. So we're trying to expand this channel as much as we can. We we really want to get a larger audience. Um, like we grow big up in our minds is we want to grow big at the same time. We're three months in this and you guys are amazing. We're, you know, 700 followers. Uh, I mean, not followers, uh, 7,000 followers. We have people are watching. Um, some videos have extreme amount of views, but we want our chats to be that live too. Right. So, um, we appreciate everybody here and don't think that we don't, <laughs> I mean, wow. Um, it's pretty cool that we, we expect big things. We, we dream big, think big and want big. So we're trying to put it all together. So that's all. Hey, how are you doing, Wilma? Wilma! <laughs> I was Fred Flintstone one year. I went to a Yankee game. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. So I went, okay, I'll tell you that joke because I seen Wilma. So uh, I had a friend at my work. He goes, yeah, I got box seats to the Yankee game. I go, yeah, are you going to be on TV? He goes, yeah, I'm, I sit right behind, right where the net is. I'll be on TV all game. Then he goes, it was, uh, uh, somehow we got, uh, what are you going to be for Halloween? I'm like, I want to be Fred Flintstone. And he goes, hey, if you were wearing that Fred Flintstone costume to the game, I'll take you, and you'll be in the game the whole game. You'll be on the TV the whole game. Well, anyway, the TV broadcast, they talked about me in the third inning, the fifth inning, the seventh inning, and after the game, they talked about me. Because I'm doing the chicken dance. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting the crowd up. I'm, I was doing everything that you could imagine. I went to the – I'm drinking a beer on TV in a Fred <laughs> Flintstone costume. <laughs> I mean, it was freaking funny. It was great. If I do those type of things, you know. Okay, guys. Well, thank you guys so much. And we'll talk to everybody on Thursday at 8 p.m. Any questions, just let me know. Uh, everybody, have a good night. Bye, guys.